This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, rostering and timesheets without the usual chaos. The, the overarching mission of St. Peter was to just make sure everybody had a wonderful dinner. That was, that was it. Like, just make sure everybody has a great piece of fish. And I'd be lying to say that if I wasn't trying to not replicate, but just be as similar in, in standards of what fish face was. I was just trying to make sure that Fish First, Fish Face Darlinghurst continued and had a little bit of legacy of what Stephen did uh, into what I do now. This is The Luminaries on the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. It's easy to break the rules. It's easy to shock people. Just about anyone can be a one-trick pony, but challenging perceptions challenging beliefs, turning myths on their heads, opening minds to a different perspective, to a different approach for a different experience. That takes a solid foundation, grit, and a lot of dedication. Josh Nyland is the chef and owner of St. Peter, the fish butchery and charcoal fish. Josh, how are you? I'm pretty tired. (laughs) How are you? Well, you, you've been incredibly busy. You've just recently opened Charcoal Fish, and we can get to that soon. But this, you've really um, turned the myths and perceptions of seafood globally on their head. Um, but tell us about the foundations that you built early on in your career to allow you to do that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. It's always flattering um, to hear that sort of thing. Uh, I Foundations, I think... Working, well, I think it was more at school. Our, our school at Maitland Grosman High, um, they got gifted a coffee machine when I was, I think, 14. And I was in uh, year nine, I think, and I was doing food technology and our, and our class got gifted a coffee machine. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And to have it just sitting idle uh, for teachers to use in their lunch breaks, I thought was a missed opportunity. So I, I asked them, would it be possible if I could set up a little coffee shop at lunchtime? Uh, and, and, and I mean, talk about putting yourself under the pump with HSC students and, you know, kids in year eight thinking they're really cool drinking lattes and stuff. But um, I just thought it would be a, a nice thing to do uh, on the lunch break uh, was to make a few coffees. So I started watching videos of, you know, Mr. Paul Bassett uh, doing Labarta training courses and doing all these things um, to, to just – try to do something a bit different and try to see what the basically what the feedback was like I think I was just more keen to get some feedback on something that I was interested in Uh, and so I did that and then I took a job in a cafe uh, close to home in East Maitland uh, at a little coffee shop and I got some really amazing um, training where I got to learn how to make some mayonnaise and I learned how to assemble a sandwich correctly uh, and then, you know, make coffee, which I, I think at the time I was really quite interested in and I thought that was quite a, a skillful technique um, that I could that I could use. So uh, I, the Thursday night late shopping was the big thing uh, in East Maitland and all my mates would end up there you know, walking around pretty much just because there was nothing better to do in East Maitland on a Thursday night. Um, And I would always ask if I could stay back to vacuum the floors to see if I could get an extra $50 out of the boss. Um, And so that's what I did. And after doing 12 months in this coffee shop and, and really trying to learn a little bit more about hospitality and socially engaging with a customer, um, I, I felt I was best prepared and ready to sort of say to mum and dad, hey, I really want to be a chef and I really want to do an apprenticeship and and go and learn more about this because it kind of got to the point where in year 10, um, you know, we're getting ready. Do we go to hate, like, do we go and do year 11 and 12? What subjects are we going to pick? All of those things. And and my mates had all kind of selected what they were going to do. And I was just wondering how many hospitality or food technology classes I could get my hands on. So I, I just said to mum and dad, I said, look, I, I really love school and, and I feel I'm okay at it. I'm, <laughs> I enjoy English, I enjoy science, I enjoy all my work at school, but I just, I wish there was, you know, 15 lessons of hospitality. <laughs> um, can I do this apprenticeship? 
And so then, you know, mum and dad straight on board and they were the ones driving me around to restaurant to restaurant to see if I could get a, you know, an interview and, and a trial. And, you know, we'd have a few meals here and there just to test the waters in a few places. Uh, and then I ended up settling on a, a restaurant in Newcastle. Uh, which is the brewery restaurant, which no longer is there, but the team that were behind that project have got East End Hub, which is Elizabeth Fox and Anthony Oton, powerhouse husband and wife team that, you know, opened my kind of eyes in terms of work ethic, um, putting putting education and training before the ego of a comp like of composed food. Um, you know what I mean? Like there was, there was this real deep rooted desire to educate a young team. I mean, I think I was one of three or four apprentices that they had in their team, um, which was just extraordinary. I know many restaurants have apprentices, but it just seems like such a commitment and, and a big, big amount of energy that's gone into the training of these people. And so, Anthony took me under his wing and he was always reading the newest cookbook and he was always watching the newest, you know, Ramsey show. And, you know, he was always trying to show me a better way of doing things. Um, but also there were some hard lessons in there as well. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, uh, naturally a challenging environment for any first year because there was aspirations of being the best, um, at that time. Um, and, but I think the best thing that I got out of working in Newcastle was obviously I was half an hour from home, uh, and I managed to pick up my, my hours very quickly, uh, to get my red peas. <laughs> so few, few L, L plate trips with mum, uh, back and forth, eventually then getting my license and, and getting more confident in, you know, my, my work basically after 12 months or 18 months that I was there, I decided that it was time to move to Sydney. Um, and although having been asked by Peter Doyle at S Restaurant to move to the city six, mu- six months prior, um, mum had a pretty tight hold of my hand to make sure that I didn't go anywhere too soon. So I ended up moving down to Sydney when I was 17. Um, and I started working with Luke Mangan at Glass Brasserie. Um, and, and yeah, that was kind of the, the, the beginning of the, the hospitality journey. And I think you know, the reason, the deep rooted reason I feel that I love food so much and why I love this industry so much is probably seeded from mum. And that's not to say that I was underneath a table, you know, with mum making pasta by any means, it was always, you know, flicking Latina fresh out of the packet. Um, But it was, it was this kind of, when I was sick, when I was younger, when I was eight and I was getting chemotherapy, you know, twice a week, you know, after that, coming back from the half an hour trip to Newcastle to go to the John Hunter Hospital and then half an hour home, before I went back to school, mum would cook me a hot lunch or a cold lunch, whatever, but majoritively it was always a hot lunch. You'd have a, you know, a pie that she'd make or, you know, just something simple and then make sure you sit down, you'd eat your lunch, get changed, get ready, and then go back to school. So... Yes, it was hugely disruptive to be away from school for a couple of hours each each kind of couple of days from school. Um, but for mum to be able to stop, be present, slow down, cook me lunch and then send me back off to school and then carry on with her day, I think that was just one of the most generous acts of hospitality and motherhood and just it was such a kind thing to do. And I know that goes without saying because it's your mum, right? But I think that uh, you just look like, you know, we've got three kids now and you look at how fleeting the days are and how intense they are and how, how much, you know, how much work you have to do in a day. But then for that to all just get big handbrake pulled up on it and let's just sit down and have some lunch together and then we can go back into it. And I think for that reason, I've always enjoyed the gesture of feeding someone and and looking at you know some kind of emotion displayed be it positive or negative on the back of something that you've given them i think that's a really powerful thing that childhood illness that you had what, what sort of impact did that have on you did it did, is that the backbone of, of the drive that you have did it did it make you grow up quicker what, what sort of impact did it have yeah i think it um yeah uh 
Well, it, it's a tricky one because it's, it's it was a lot uh, to take on board. Like you get told, you know, your son may die, um, and you hear that get said to your parents. And now, in hindsight, looking back at that, for them to have kept it together <laughs> as as well as they did, I, I think is is a credit to them. Um, and you know, we don't really talk about it too much post um, everything happening because it, it is a fairly it was a fairly intense time uh, in our lives, but um, I do believe that it definitely gave me, you know, a, a sense of purpose and, and motivation and, and uh, that life is all very, um, um, it, it can be very fleeting uh, and, and that, you know, you need to take your opportunities uh, when they come. And I wouldn't say that it, you know, it motivates me by any means, but I think it's just uh, – the rocket pack on your back where you're just like, if you want something, then you go after it and you get it. And if you can't get it, then like, what do you have to do to do that? Like how, you know, uh, how do I articulate this? I think it's more having writing down your thoughts as frequently as you can so that if something's not quite right, then you can actually articulate them on paper and then get about sorting it out um, afterwards. And that's something that I've always continued to do, Um, whether it's manually writing it down because I do enjoy the art of putting pen to paper um, or if it's just putting things into your mobile phone. But I I do keep track of things that I want to be intentional with and that I do want to prioritise. Give us a sense of the young Josh Nyland that came to Sydney when he was 17 and working, he worked in some incredible restaurants as you built your career. What was the young Josh Nyland like? And and do you have any stories of that time? Uh, I think... I was relatively arrogant um, and thought that, you know, I was coming to the big smokes to really kind of step it up a notch and and get stuck into it, having, you know, I wouldn't by any means say that I conquered Newcastle. It was just a beginning where where a lot of people were around you, not pumping you up by any means, but definitely giving you the good structured, you know, backbone of your, your technique and skill that you needed to go into Sydney because I remember having a conversation with my chef Anthony and saying, all right, I'm, I'm going to go to Sydney. And he's like, oh, <laughs> all right, well, you know, here's, here's all the things that you don't know how to do and that I don't think you're as good at as you think you are. Um, so there was a real clear, you know, you know, let's hone in on these areas before you head off. Um, and that was very, very helpful. Um, but I, I remember just being in awe of the whole Sydney dining scene. I mean, before even taking a job with Luke, I think my first, you know, big fancy dining experience was at Aria. I was with my sister and my sister's friend and, um, you know, I was, what, I don't know, maybe 16. And, and obviously I, I'd eaten at Est as well to by myself and I'd met Peter and but going to Aria as well to just sit in that room and see Matt come out and go table to table and saying hello to everybody and you know even then going to Assiette and seeing Warren Turnbull you know running around like a madman in that kitchen and, and watching Justin North run around crazy and Bacass and you know it was the and and then Facet four in hand you know there was all these guys that were like head down bum up you know getting the job done and I was just in complete or of their teams and their skills um, and how visible it all was. And I think that was one of the big things. There was a big sense of an open kitchen back then, and I know there is now, but you think back to all those big, grand, open, even intimate small rooms, they were were all very open and you could see everything Um, and you could see what kind of pace you were walking into and and what what the expectations were on a young chef in that team. So... um, to get the job at glass uh, was incredible uh, and I was put onto pastry straight away um, and the pastry kitchen if you haven't been into glass brasserie is you know quite a grand setting it's right at the front door um, and I just remember being told that some of my tasks would be to bake off a hundred brulees in the morning um, and then segment down a couple of boxes of oranges ready for crepe Suzette and you know zesting oranges and uh, yeah, buttering and sugaring, you know, molds ready to go for souffles and then dropping those souffles to order. And, you know, like the, all of those real desserts that required actual skill and knowledge to be able to produce consistently throughout an a la carte service. And, you know, um, 
it was very manual and it was very exciting. And, and you know, uh, working under Leanne Beck at the time was intense and quite, you know, uh, there was a lot being asked of you. Um, but Joe Pavlovich commanded the respect of that whole kitchen and, and it was reciprocated. We all just watched Joe in awe of how he could lead a brigade of some 22, 23 cooks and, and get through 350 covers like it was nothing. <laughs> it was, you know, I, I still think back, you know, like and watching Joe pick up 16 dockets across his hands and then just scream at, at, at us all basically in terms of what he needed. And to watch Marjan Alguera, MJ, on the meat section, squeezing and poking and prodding about, you know, 24 steaks at one time, categorizing his rares away from his medium rares, away from his medium wells and his mediums. And, you know, it was insane. Um, there was no kind of cryvac pouches of his, the 25 rare bags that I set before service. It was manually done to order and the garlic and the thyme thrown into the pan to baste over the top of the steak. You know, everything was manual and everything was, you know, of the highest standard. And those kinds of things were just um, so critical in my learning. But to answer your question, which I haven't done yet, what was I like? I think I was just, I was learning meat and chicken and fish and all these things at TAFE in, at Ultimo College. And I was kind of just like, wow, I wish I could do that at my work. Um, kind of, you know, frustrated that I'm on pastry. And I felt at the time I was like, well, they've just forgotten about me. I'm just a soldier. I'm a cog in the works. And I just, I'm just turning up and I'm, I'm doing my brulees and I'm, you know, so you, you, it's easy to think back in hindsight and go, well, that was all wonderful education. And, and that's something that, Oh, I'll always be glad that I did. But at the time, you're just like, well, I'd kind of like to be you know, MJ, kind of squeezing steak because that makes me a real chef, right? Um, and so I I ended up doing a trial at Restaurant Balzac with Matt Kemp. And this was about six months after being into Sydney. And I, I went to Balzac and I was just like, wow, this is incredible. Matt's here. His wife's on the floor, you know, the brigade's full of these guys that all just look like they just haven't slept in weeks. It's just hardcore, intense, you know, backs to the wall, you know, but everybody was just running and they wanted to be the best. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I got shown all the right things on my trial and I just thought, well, this is great. And so I went back to work the next day and as I came through the front doors, I had Luke Mangan in the bar standing next to Joe Pavlovich and they said, all right, take a seat. And I was, I was like, oh, what's going on, fellas? And then uh, they, they said, oh, how did Balzac go? And then at that point, I realized how small Sydney was and how much of an idiot I was. Um, and I, I was embarrassed and I was shocked. And, um, you know, it was a big, big ego check um, that I thought that I was ready for something else when really I'd only just begun. Um and basically, you know, Luke Mangan said to me in that moment, he said, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you've got to start at the bottom and you've got to work your way up. And I think it was then at that point where they realized, I think as much as I realized that I really wanted to be <laughs> as good as I could be. Like I really wanted to get as much out of this experience as I could. And I don't know whether it took me doing something silly like that to be noticed or, or to have their attention. But then from that point, then they put me into the hot kitchen. I did the cold section and then I did some garnish work as well. Um, and then I do, got to do a bit of meat garnish. And so then there was a real, but then I got pushed even harder and I got to see more and I, I gained a lot more from that experience. So, um, yeah, a, a little bit of a, a curly beginning. Um, but I ended up doing, you know, uh, about close to 18 months, uh, at glass brasserie and, and that was 18 months of 200 seat, you know, hardcore bistro brasserie, <laughs> um, work, which, which I loved very much. Uh, You've worked with uh, many incredible chefs like Peter Doyle and, and Steve Hodges, but your understanding of seafood is incredible, but when did you first start? realizing or having an interest in seafood and realizing the opportunities? 
Um, well, I, yeah, again, it's very kind um, to say that. I, I mean, when you work for somebody like Stephen Hodges and when you have Peter Doyle uh, as a mentor and, and somebody who has always had, you know, a significantly strong, you know, seafood-based uh, repertoire, um, you know, it's easy, like, to, to really take – uh, a lot of inspiration from their cuisine and, and to also be just in complete awe and ad- admiration uh, to, to how they work. Um, I think Peter, obviously, with his beginnings at Reflection um, and Cicada and, you know, Celsius and all these kind of, like, he had his own businesses and there was a sense of, like, no waste and, and being respectful to make sure that you use everything. There was no three hat budget where you could just purchase, 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 and then disregard what goes in the bin. Um, so there was a, a real sense of um, knowledge about what to do tomorrow when, when today's food is no longer today's. So there was a lot of good learning from that, but then working for Stephen, I've never met <laughs> another fish chef with the kind of acumen for fish as Stephen, like to have the ability to have fish, continue to arrive to the door without knowledge of what we're going to receive. We just basically said, we want the best all the time. Um, we don't, we don't have any bias over what species comes in, but we just want the best. So that would mean in a week, you know, you would see upwards of 20 to 25 species of fish come through the door. And that was, you know, I feel incredibly spoiled to have been 18 years old with being underneath Stephen's arm, basically being ushered through, Australia's, you know, waters basically and being told, no, don't steam that one. No, no, no. You have to pan fry that one. Don't poach that one. No, you have to do it, you know, bake it like this. And, you know, it was really intense black and white information that was just like, don't do that, do this. And it was just clear. And once that came out of his mouth once, then it never changed. Like that was just law. Um, And then going and then leaving from Fish Face at that time to then go and work in other restaurants, you know, you never forget what Stephen said. You always were respectful to whoever your chef was next. But then upon returning back to Fish Face later in my cooking, he was as consistent, if not more focused on what he had originally said all those years ago. So he was very consistent um, with his education. And to kind of speak to how do you kind of, how have you accumulated the amount of knowledge that you have? I think it's because with people like Peter and Stephen pouring all of themselves into me and educating me personally and having a sense of responsibility with their teachings as well. Like if there was no intimacy of learning, if there was no intimacy of like, this is how you do it and I wouldn't do it like that. And these three times back at pier with Greg and, you know, these two times back at reflections or, you know, the kind of really interesting, fascinating historical knowledge of what they've done with similar species and with similar ingredients. I just keep putting that in the bank. Like I just keep putting that in notebooks and just writing them down at the end of the day, because eventually they'll be useful. They, they will be extremely helpful one day. Um, even if they don't make sense right this second, they will be extremely handy. And one particular case that came up was when Stephen, in a lucid state of, you know, craziness one night, making brulee at one in the morning with me cleaning the kitchen down with one other person, we were listening to Stephen just bang on about everything. And I just said to him, hey, you know, I'm actually finding it difficult to continue to produce garnish after garnish after garnish with all of these different species that are coming in with respect to trying to make sure that people actually understand the flavor of the fish, but whilst also making sure that people understand that what I'm trying to do with this fish is exciting and worth coming to fish face for. And this was when I was like, I think 19. And obviously at that time I was just really wanting to impress upon everybody. And I think you in particular, whenever you'd come into fish face, I think I remember giving you a piece of, you know, soy marinated uh, hapuka milt, that I've had in story for some four or five weeks, just thinking it was the coolest thing ever. And I needed somebody who kind of got it to taste it. And you came and did that. And even things like the John Dory liver and parsley on toast as well. So I was trying really hard, but I remember just saying to Steve, what, um, how, how best would you go about garnish selection with regards to 
fish species coming through the door so that you didn't, you know, mollycoddle the fish to uh, mollycoddle the garnish too much and make sure that the fish was still the hero. And he said, well, rather than thinking of fish like fish, why don't you just think of it more like meat? And he was just yelling basically the whole time. And I just thought, well, that's really interesting. He goes, well, how many bloody recipes have you got for a pig? And how many recipes have you, you know, how many times have you cooked a, a beef fillet? And how many times have you cooked a pigeon? And he was just ranting off all these things about how a pigeon can almost be as similar to a blue mackerel. Um, and then, you know, when you look at a tuna loin, it could almost look like a beef fillet. And the fact that swordfish nearly looks like a pig. And he was just, just bashing out all these different hypotheticals. And I just thought, well, that's really interesting. And it then it actually did become really a lot simpler to select garnishes based on the knowledge that, well, if this was a cow, then I could actually do this in, in such a way that it makes more sense to me rather than just rolling out the lemon wedges and braised fennel and, you know, tomatoes and all the habitual routine fish garnishes that we forever have eaten and cooked as chefs. So I wouldn't say that I went to the same extremes and lengths that I have now to this day, but it was just a really encouraging kind of wild conversation that took place one night um, that I don't know if he even remembers, but <laughs> it was um, it was a good it was a good little uh, leg up, and and it was something that got squirrelled away in my notebook and and made sense later. Well, let's have a look at um, what you've built. You started with Saint Peter, and um, how difficult was it? challenging the realms and, and myths of seafood, but also running a, running your own business and having the, those responsibilities? Yeah, um, I think as well, and I know um, you know this as well, but um, Julie, my wife, um, she she's an incredible chef, like period. Um, she worked at the Cass and Mark and um, – uh, aqua dining, uh, and then at Est as well, and and at the Fat Duck. So um, she's you know extremely talented, and also opened Six Penny. Um, and she, we just decided we just decided that we wanted to start a family, um, and we wanted to be based here in Sydney. And so the desires to work overseas or you know in other parts of the world was just not there. We just really loved Sydney, and we wanted to be close to our families and and have our own. So. Um, St. Peter is really, um, the unpacking of what Julie and I love the most about eating. And I think St. Peter started as being inspired so much by the restaurants like, uh, St. John, uh, and Saison, uh, in San Francisco when it was in its original space. Uh, and, and a number of just little, small, nice, just beautiful restaurants where it's usually the chef cooking for you, um, and the menu being, you know, really transient and just changing based on the seasons uh, and, and offering an a la carte experience. Um, that was the kind of model that we wanted to, to do. So Julie and I came to each other on the same day with St. Peter as the name, just coincidentally. But I said, I know what we're going to call the restaurant. And she goes, oh, I, I thought of a name too. What did you think? I said, well, St. Peter. And then she's like, what? That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. And then, but she hadn't quite unpacked it as thoroughly as what I had in my head, in the sense that it was to reference the John Dory in the form of Saint Pierre, um, but also the patron saint of fishermen, um, and the black spot that represents Saint Peter is the spot of the John Dory where it got marked with the with the finger when it got taken out of the water. So there's a whole lot of reference points uh, with regards to fish that that is the name Saint Peter, although a lot of people still come in and call me Peter. Um, so, um, but yeah, Julie and I opened it. Uh, Julie made all the tables in the restaurant. She she sanded them all back. She, you know, oiled them all. She she you know assembled them all. <laughs> it was quite amazing. Um, there was a restaurant, uh, Spiedo, uh, at um, uh, Westfield, which Alessandro uh, had. And upon its completion of its time there, we um, we went in and kind of cleaned up the scraps a little bit. <laughs> and so. We took the bonquette, we took all the chairs, we took all the table bases, um, which were gastronomes and bowls and whisks and all those things uh, because we were doing this ourselves. Like this was our money. This was the most risky thing that we've ever done uh, and we had no bearings of if it was going to work or not, so we didn't want to overcapitalize uh, on, on things at the beginning. 
So um, we rounded all that up and we'd found a great space, which used to be Toco uh, on Oxford Street, Huntington. Um, and it's funny that, you know, St. Peter used to be a sushi restaurant, used sushi train. Um, but we, you know, we took down the 42 down line and we stripped off the eight inches of pleather and like Japanese trees that had been painted over the walls and stuff. We ripped everything out basically. Um, and Julie drew so many different variations of what that restaurant would look like um, based on how many seats can we get in there <laughs> and how little of a kitchen can we give you um, so that we can get as many people in there as we can um, so that we don't, you know, shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, and, you know, we, we opened basically uh, and, and we did so in a way that we felt confident that we could pay back um, the money that we'd spent uh, and, I just remember, I know I've told this story before, but we spent four and a half grand on fish on the first delivery. And that just scared the life out of me. Um, and that was only that, like that was only fish. And then all, all the other things on top of that. And, um, it was just Alana Sapwell, uh, my other uh, old chef that I had Ollie Penmit and myself in the kitchen. And then, you know, day one of day one of our, um, adventure with St. Peter, we, we lost our restaurant manager, just things just didn't work out. Um, and then we were restaurant managerless, <laughs> um, for, for the whole day of frantically trying to patch that hole. And then like an angel, uh, Wimmy Winkler appeared, uh, and said, I'll help, I'll help you out for the weekend. And I just thought, well, that's great. We'll throw her in. And then Saturday morning we opened for our first official service and, 10 a.m., you know, you got Pat and Miffy out the front and you've got, you know, Terry booked in for dinner and, you know, all that stuff. Like you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders and also, you know, the weight of money that you've spent that you haven't paid back yet and all those sorts of things as well. But the, the priority, obviously, is to make sure that everybody gets it and everybody understands what you're trying to do and also the, the, the product's excellent. And so you just rely on just the scent of an oily rag basically to keep you going because there's no drinking water, there's no eating food, there's no sleeping. You just you just go, um, and that's really you know that that's really hard. You look back on that and you think, wow, I don't know how we got through it, but you do. Um, and you know, Wimmy stayed beyond the weekend, and just just a few well, a couple of months ago turned five years with us. So Wimmy's you know still extremely you know huge part of our our operation that we have now um but yeah julie and i just navigated it each week got a good accountant uh he gave us the best advice each week on on how to to weather some storms i mean there was occasions where we spent too much on food and you know we didn't have enough staff and then you know that flipped back the other way and you know vivid happened and then everybody leaves the <laughs> leaves the suburbs and goes to the city and yeah, so there was just so many lessons to learn, um, but but basically it was just the the overarching mission of St Peter was to just make sure everybody had a wonderful dinner. That was that was it. Like just make sure everybody has a great piece of fish. And I'd be lying to say that if I wasn't trying to not replicate, but just be as similar in in standards of what Fish Face was. I was just trying to make sure that Fish Face Fish Face Darlinghurst continued and had a little bit of legacy of what Stephen did uh, into what I do now. This episode of The Luminaries on Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Deputy, helping managers and staff do their best work. Hospitality is all about the connection. A business starts with passion, but gets bogged down with all the complexities that come with life, society, and rules. If you can simplify this mundane, then people can be happy and they can thrive. And when you have happy staff members and happy managers, your customers will sense it. They'll be happy. And you create that connection. That connection is hospitality is about. For more information, go to deputy.com. Was there a moment that um, you felt comfortable in your feet and you felt St. Peter was where you wanted it to be and you were then had the confidence to really branch out and do what you've done now? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, still no. 
he'll know. Like, and and that's not like I mean, the caliber of staff that we have now, the team that we have in place is just extraordinary. And you know, you'd you'd be able to leave, and and everything would be totally fine and great. But there's still there's no like, oh sweet, we made it to you know, and and like it's just funny how things just change. Like the reason fish butchery opened was because we ran out of room uh, at St. Peter. St. Peter um, basically was just, it was a 34 seat restaurant that was doing 95 people in a service. Um, and it was just, it got to the point where it was like, I, I actually can't hang any more fish from anything in our cool room. Uh, and I can't make another eye chip because a fish only has two eyes and I can't put another liver on toast because it's just one liver. And so the expectations of having a St. Peter experience was becoming a burden somewhat. Like I couldn't produce the menu that I wanted to give people or what was being expected of St. Peter to give to people. Um, I mean, the New York times wrote about us and said about it's the place to get, you know, an extremely creative experience with fish and, and, you know, such high standards and all that sort of stuff. And that was like, you know, that was extremely flattering and wonderful. But six months after that, then we had to open fish butchery because we just couldn't, we couldn't manage what was happening. So um, we opened fish butchery 10 doors up in a hair salon. um, And, you know, uh, coincidentally, it was 20 years prior, it was a cafe. So it still had grease trap and it still had exhaust and things there. So we got really lucky in that sense again. So again, the ambition was not to overcapitalize, but it was to make sure that we, prioritize exactly what we needed to spend and you know what were the most big ticket high impact details of that business that we could execute and that was to make sure that there was full transparency of the product so to take inspiration from loon in melbourne and the croissant making system that they have in place that they you know their big shop um it was to put a big piece of marble in the middle of the room put a glass box on the end of it and then anything that came in that day would be very well manicured and placed into that little glass cube at the end in a singular form. And then over the top of that marble might be, you know, 500 kilos of Bruce's fish from the corner inlet or, you know, four big tunas from Heidi up in Mooloola Bar. Like the, to have that available uh, and visible to Sydney siders, I thought was just you know, a wonderful thing, especially on Oxford Street, Paddington, where it's always been, you know, haute couture. It's always been fashion. And, you know, it's always been, you know, this really visible, you know, shopping precinct. Um, But then to come in and feel a similar sense of boutique, but fish, Um, you know, so the location of where fish butchery is lended itself as to a decision to why to uh, dress it up in such a way. So, Paul Farag and Todd Garrett were were hugely, um, you know, like such a, a good foundation to have those two in there upon opening to make sure that the systems and standards were all there um, and to make sure that the quality of fish going across to St. Peter and that was going out retail um, was of the highest standard. So, um, yeah, fish butchery exists because St. Peter ran out of room uh, and St. Peter needed a supplier um, that was producing the work that was in my head. Um, so we became our own supplier, basically. Um, so that's why that exists, yeah. St. Peter is uh, very different to what it originally um, began as uh, in the sense of the experience that you have when you walk in the restaurant. COVID's changed many things for many people. What, what sort of impact has it had on what you do at at St. Peter and the fish butchery. Yeah. Um, I mean, COVID's been a hugely damaging, um, experience for so many people. And, uh, I, I would never have wished for this to happen ever. Uh, and I mean, I find myself in a somewhat fortunate position where we've been able to continue, um, producing our work and we've been able to continue to engage with our guests and make sure that we, you know, keep working hard through all of this and making sure that we keep our staff employed. That's been a real priority. Um, but to have written the whole fish cookbook and then gone up to Brisbane to the good food guide and then losing a chef's hat, um, which was all extremely important at that time. Um, I, you know, sitting in that room up in Brisbane was embarrassing and disappointing. 
and frustrating and all of those things because it's a real big kind of, you know, <laughs> I'd be like, like, I mean, it's the kind of thing, do you talk about this or don't you? And it's like, it's so, like you wear it so heavy. I mean, you get, you go through January, February, uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and you're just, you don't want to not be there ever. Like you want to be on every single service so much so that you're belittling, you know, the abilities of the staff that you have. Um, and yeah, for the, for the handful of services that I found myself absent during that time, then naturally, you know, people come through. Um, and I, you know, I look back at that and think, well, if the standards were better or the systems were better or, you know, all of that upkeep was better then you know, would have been a better result. But, um, I was just, um, it was a good wake up call at that time. Uh, and I just, we, I, I had written the whole fish and I, two days later after being up in Brisbane, then I got to go overseas and travel with the book, uh, and, and got to see lots of different things and have some good experiences. And then coming back, it was a real kind of head down, bum up mentality where it's let's, let's do the best we can. Let's, let's make the food exactly how we want to make it. Um, and then getting to, I think a, two weeks before we all got locked down last year, um, we got reviewed again. Um, and I was really happy with what we did. The photos got taken. And then the weekend that we all got shut down <laughs> the Tuesday after was meant to be, you know, good food in the paper. Um, and I think at that time it was like, oh, I was really disappointed because I wanted I wanted something to remunerate the staff with for such a huge amount of effort and attention going in at a time when we all wanted to prove that we were, we were kind of better than what was kind of what had been said. Um, and I don't know, there was a lot of like, it was a, a flattening experience to get locked down obviously um, because we were scared and we didn't really know what to do. Um, but then I just kind of went into the mode of Miss an Island at home and I just, you know, it was almost like starting again. You just, you work, sleep, work, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and I think COVID for me personally was the best thing for me personally to happen because it allowed me time to spend with the kids. It allowed me more time to spend with Julie. Uh, it allowed me more time to think, well, am I really happy professionally? Like, am I happy with what we're turning out? Is the direction of the restaurant the way that I want it to be? Um, and, yeah, we yeah, we made some big decisions. We said, All right, well let's let's tidy up the kitchen upstairs. Let's let's really make that more of a workable space because that's always been difficult. So Saint Peter had its own prep kitchen upstairs. And then what's the restaurant that we really want to have? And I remember talking to you about it. I said it's gonna be a hybrid of Swan Oyster Depot, meats and John meats, Angler meat, size on, all those things that, you know, I like about a restaurant. And we just said, we're just going to put 16 seats along the front of it. And where I suppose at times I've felt challenged about passing on information or details of the menu, I've been always challenged as to how to continue to pass on the, the kind of really granular details of the menu to our front of house team because we change it every day. Um, and I think that's part of what's special about St. Peter, at least it is for me. Um, but having the knowledge to then pass on and to be passed on to the guest, um, I think was just somewhere that we always lacked. Uh, and to open it up so that the chefs and the front of house team could work together and speak to the work that we'd done and the products that we were serving over the counter, some 1.5 meters away. Like that was so exciting for us. Um, and St. Peter really found a bit of a new life um, and, and more joy and just more happiness. Like I was far happier and prouder of the product and the room had grown up. Um, and I know Julie and I, I speak for Julie as well. Like we just, we was amazed at how beautiful the room could become with more attention. Um, and that was a, that was a really good thing to happen. And we had a really good, some 10 or 12 months um, before them being locked down again. And, but the lockdown this second time is actually just, it's almost just like rolling through. And I mean, I can't speak to the 300 days now that Melbourne have had, but, um, for, for Sydney to have, to have had such a good run for a full year and then go back into it, like I felt better this time. Like I felt 
you know, the team was ready for it because it was a similar team to the one that we closed with last time. Um, yeah, that was, yeah. And then the second lockdown brought about the thinking of charcoal fish because, again, I found myself having nights off. Like, you know, you leave work at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon after sending out your Mr. Island at home products to then go home early and then, you, you know, you cook dinner and you put the kids to bed and you, you do all those wonderful, nice things that are normal. Um, and then you kind of get sick of cooking <laughs> at home and then you're like, all right, well, let's go and get Charlie's. Let's go get the charcoal chicken around the corner just because that's a really easy dinner. And I'm like, wow, this is an amazing, easy, accessible model that's such a pleasure to use. And it's just, it's not junk food. It's not health food. It's just dinner. And I just thought that's so necessary and so what's needed with fish. Um, there is no ease of access to just nice, easy, beautiful grilled fish. Um, and, and that was, it then just became like every day to Julia, I'm like, we, we need to find this site. We need to find this site. And it was just, you know, just unrelenting. Um, and I just kept, you know, drawing what it looked like and menus, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, 12 months later to be, well, not even 12 months later, shorter than that, like we're standing in it. Um, and we're flat out and it's exciting. And I haven't cooked the way that I'm cooking now since I was 18 with Steve. And, you know, it, it's a really nice feeling to, to see people, like a new generation of young people coming in with their families and having a great fish and chips or having a great grilled piece of fish. I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. Well, at Charcoal Fish, uh, there's a real celebration of Murray Cod. Tell, tell us why that is and, and why it benefits from that sort of cooking style. Yeah, um, Murray Cod's a unique fish. Uh, I mean, I, I got asked the other day, is, is charcoal fish playing host to a cellar door for a cooner? Um, and, I mean, I wish it was. But um, it's, it's just a cooner is able, has been able to produce this wonderful cod, basically, that's white-fleshed, really firm, dense, meaty, very savoury kind of um, taste. Uh, and the skin is a little bit thicker than what you would find on, you know, other species like snappers and, and flatheads and things. But because I've been working with it now for quite a while, we've developed so many ideas around what it can be. Um, and I never like looking at fish as a vehicle. Like I always like seeing, you know, unique details of each fish and what, what they should go with based on their characteristics. But Murray Cod is just one of those versatile fish and I'm saying this with all kindness to this fish, but it is so similar to chicken uh, and so similar to pork um, that it allows you to really just remove straight away the fact that it's a fish. You can put it aside, like forget that it's a fish. Um, and then as soon as you do that, then just it's Pandora's box in terms of opportunity. Um, and the reason for the selection of it specifically for charcoal fish is because I can generate 95% return. Um, and that because of the thinking of Rebecca Lara at Fish Butchery, the thinking of Paul Farag, the thinking of myself, um, you know, all of our team that has worked with us, even back to Alana, um, Sapwell, like charcoal fish to me, I mean, it's a necessary business model that brings ease and accessibility uh, and full transparency uh, to a new generation of customer that that really does d demand more um there's so many people that want the knowledge of where their fish is from how it was caught how it was captured and you know like a bit of a location um and some knowledge behind it um and confidence uh so that they can see the value um i mean so many times that we see you know twelve dollar fifty thirteen dollar fifty fish and chips i mean how do you do that like <laughs> like i mean that's I'm still stumped by how you can you can produce that caliber of dish for for that cheap. Um, I mean, at the moment, our fish and chips is twenty eight dollars, and I know that is expensive. But to me, the chips are getting produced by our team, so the potatoes come in dirty, they get scrubbed, and then they get chipped um, by us, uh, and then they get steamed, par, par fried, and then fried to order. And then the fish, I mean, the Murray Cod is not a cheap fish. It's $20 a kilo, whole, scale on, guts in. And 
like I said, the return is far better with this business model. It allows us to utilize 95%. Um, we can use the fat, we can use the liver, we can use the scales, we can use the eyes. There's so many things that we can use. And all the bones and all the trimmings go into our gravy that we make to do the Murray Cod gravy roll. So, I mean, the chicken shop model is actually the best model to look at when opening a fish shop. Um, or the butcher model, the meat butchery model, is the best mos- possible model that we can be looking at with reference to how to set up a fish shop. So, I mean... Speaking just as a general overview of all of this, there's so much that we could be learning from the world of meat uh, and poultry with regards to then how we handle fish. Um, You know, to give you a hypothetical, like I grew up with mum going into a local butcher and saying, you know, can I get a few sausages today? Or like, you know, the butcher, sorry, saying to my mum, you know, we've just made sausages. And so then mum would be like, great, let's get half a dozen we'll go and have sausages tonight. And then the following week, then we go back and he's just corn some beef ready to, to go. And so that was what we had for dinner. There was clear communication. Um, it was it was understood what he had done, what his work was, and then that, the fact that then we were taking that home and that was our dinner. Um, there is a matrix for every single part of the animal um, that goes to use. I mean, you just think about families that rear an animal from birth through to slaughter you know, there is nothing saying that they're going to just take the top loins off or they're just going to take the racks out. You know what I mean? Like, that's what we're talking about when we refer to fish. Like, if we're only engaging with the fillets, then we're only engaging with half of the product. You've now got three incredible businesses. What's the best business advice that you've ever been given in, in hospitality? Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know. It's almost a metaphor. Like, Stephen saying like you know this was again when i worked at fish face for the very first time it was walking into the morning and walking you know through the front door around around the bar at darlinghurst there and then into the kitchen and then you start walking well working through through everything you needed to do and you, you know you're running yourself around and and then he would come in at three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon if we were lucky um and then he would walk through the same front doors and then get to the front of the kitchen and as much as there was pleasantries from time to time with a hello and how are you, it was usually, you know, did you clean the glass? And it's like, what do you mean? And he said, well, look at the glass. It's filthy. Like, did you clean the glass? I said, well, no, I thought, you know, the front of the house was coming in. That's, you know, that's what they're going to do. And without, you know, ranting off the expletives that come along with that, then it should have been done. And, I mean, I think that kind of, sense of responsibility that you know even though it's not your personal business details matter like so many details that aren't seen and i mean i've learned now that cooking is such a secondary thing that happens you know what i mean that's that that's the fun part that's (laughs) like you know having been spoiled for the last three weeks standing in front of a big grill down at charcoal fish has been like being a kid again it's like awesome it's like the most fun thing to do even though you're under the pump and you know we're turning out a lot of food um that's really fun and so much so that it almost feels lazy um that i'm not actually doing the real work um where you know the work of leading and mentoring and all those things and and the details of our other businesses need to be seen you know what i mean and i need to be able to go and do those things but i think it's an interesting time that you've called because you know <laughs> we're at this point right now where we're like wow we got we've got three shops now um and and there's a lot of work to do uh and it's not just standing there grilling fish all day because that would be wonderful if i was able to do that <laughs> but um uh yeah i think Stephen's message was just you know the the little details matter and and just to make sure that you nothing goes unseen you need to be on top of everything and that's from financial point of view through to leadership and and how you retain and maintain standards and and look after your people um i mean julie and i have made some quite huge decisions in the last week alone or even in the last two days um about the forward planning and thinking around the businesses and and how we're best going to approach summer um like it I was never expecting 
charcoal fish to be the received the way that it has. It's been really, you know, wonderful and exciting. Um, but I feel that's indicative of how Sydney is going to return to its dining scene. Um, like Neil put it a couple of weeks ago, he said there's going to be a stampede. And I, <laughs> I believe that, like, um, the, the depravity of not having the joy of a meal has just got to the point where we're all just busting at the seams to get out uh, and celebrate, you know, food and social, <laughs> uh, you know, the joys of life, basically. So um, we're seeing a bit of that at the moment at Charcoal Fish. It's been that goosebump kind of moment, seeing people really excited again and genuine enthusiasm for, for something new. St. Peter started when you and Julie wanted to start a family and stay in Sydney and build your own business. And now you have three establishments. What are you, what are you most proud of over this time? Um, oh, I'm proud of, I'm proud of Julie and I'm, I'm proud of her resilience and ability to, you know, <laughs> work so hard and all the work that she does is so unseen. Um, I mean, I kind of get to take, the cream on top like i get <laughs> i get the cream on top and the cherry um but then she's the one who does such a, a large amount of our work um uh, making sure that our business um you know uh, is is maintained and just the maintenance and the upkeep of any business is is extraordinary um and i mean not often seen as glamorous um parts of the work but i mean to have been a chef um to then you know, now owning and operating a restaurant and being a mum and, you know, all of those things, to be able to, you know, transition through that as easily <laughs> and intelligently as I've ever seen. Like, I mean, she's she's extraordinary. Um, so I think I, I'm most proud of our resilience as, as a friendship uh, and as a partnership. I think that's what I'm most proud of because, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's not the easiest in industry. It's not conducive or historically has been conducive to maintaining good relationships and good friendships and, and you know, all of those things. So um, that would be what I'm most proud of and, and, you know, our kids are healthy and happy and, um, you know, our teams are strong and, and, and we're going well. But, um, yeah, I I think 10 years, 10 years married and nearly 13 years together – um, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Well, Josh, um, what you both have achieved is so extraordinary and I know there's so much more to come as well. We've loved having you on the luminaries on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. Please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Hux. Um, yeah, I know that all of our chats always end up into this kind of like leaning back into the psychiatrist chair and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> unpacking all the all the, you know, bits that are deep on, on my mind at the moment and you've, you have picked the right moment to have a chat. But um, you being able to offer that uh, to this industry uh, is, is a wonderful thing. This isn't a fleeting idea to give chefs a little bit of a voice um, and it shouldn't be seen as a, as a hype chat. You know what I mean? This is like just real conversation and, and hence why there's some – honesties in this chat that we've just had that you know i feel you know this isn't about me this is i hope somebody listening thinking well that kind of sounds a little bit the same uh or similar and you know with instagram painting a certain picture uh and with you know things that you read and see and hear and everything it's not without you know the other half that you don't want people seeing on instagram and things so um to everybody out there with a lot on their minds and a lot on their plates and things not gearing the way that they had ever hoped. Um, please remain resilient. Please remain tough. Um, you know, this is see it as an opportunity and see it as a moment in time that we all just weathered together. And, you know, uh, I know circumstances are harder than others for, for some, but you know, there is help. There is always attention that can be given to you. Just reach out. Um, but thank you. Uh, to you, Hux, and well done, Australia. We're almost, we're almost there. We're getting there. Hang on. <laughs> well, Josh, thanks, mate. Uh, you're an absolute legend, and um, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Hux. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.